Thank you for tuning in to TG Talk. My name is Sailor Schwab, and I am SAE's Assistant Director of Communications. The SAE Foundation is back this month with another great interview. Foundation CEO Steve Mitchell interviewed Les Ireland, SAE alumnus, Vice Chairman of the SAE Foundation Board of Trustees, and Executive Sponsor of SAE's brand new initiative, Career Connect. Currently, Les works as a strategic consultant, and this episode focuses on creating your personal brand, developing your leadership style, and leveraging your experiences and lessons learned to showcase the value you bring to an organization. I hope that you enjoy it, and once you've finished the episode, head over to the SAE portal to sign up for SAE Career Connect as a career mentor or mentee. Successful alumni and undergraduates are already registered and waiting to be matched with career mentors and mentees. Visit portal.sae.net to log in. Come sing to Sigma Alpha. Epsilon, Epsilon, Sigma Alpha, Epsilon, Sigma Good afternoon, Les. How are you? Good, Steve. How about yourself? I'm good, thank you. I'm at the airport today, so if you see people buzzing around behind me, just try to ignore it as best you can. So I saw on the uh, March of the Madness, Towson's participating in, you've got a big matchup this week. Yeah, we made it through the first round against uh, Nevada, Reno, which was exciting. And now we're going up against Kentucky, so the stakes are a little bit higher. So we look forward to seeing how we uh, fare tomorrow. And if you get past Kentucky, there's a, a Cincinnati team in the wings, provided they get past that Indiana team. Each step, well, it's Indiana is always a, always a tough one. So we look, we look forward to the challenge as we move ahead. Yeah, we, we both have a rough road. As they say in the tournament, right? One game at a time. That's, that's it. That's it. I always, uh, they, uh, my significant other, Jen, teaches uh, yoga, and she'll say, if you came in with an intention, I'll, mine is always survive in advance. That's all I want to do. Well, I so uh, the, I think with the March to Madness, the key is you want to pick up more brothers as you go along. First, first round, you get a couple of guys that participate. The second round, you rally the team a little bit more. The key is to have as many guys participating when you get to the final round. Exactly. That, that's, that is the strategy in a nutshell. So Les, it's a, it's a real honor and a privilege to have you on here today. I've been looking forward to this for some time now. Uh, for those that don't know, uh, Les is the uh, vice chair for the foundation. Uh, so Les, if you wouldn't mind, would you tell us a little bit about yourself and some of your career? You've had an amazing career and I think it would help everybody to just provide some context if they knew a little bit more about you. Sure. Uh, on the personal side, I was born and raised in Easton, Maryland, which is a small town on Maryland's Eastern shore. Uh, my dad was a carpenter. My mom worked on the assembly line. So I'd always look back and say, three key things that they taught us was work hard, help others, and nothing comes for free. So it's kind of been, uh, been my mantra as I've gone through uh, my career. I attended Towson State University just outside of Baltimore and graduated from Towson in 86 with a degree in business with a concentration in marketing. Uh, while I was at Towson, I, was, uh, I joined SAE in 1984 as a sophomore and, uh, and we could talk more about that as we get into the fraternity side of the discussion. But uh, while in the fraternity, I serve various roles in the fraternity. And um, I think the fraternity uh, piqued my interest in being a leader so much so that I went on to become a senator in the SGA um, at Towson and served not only fraternity, but the university as well. Uh, another important thing that happened uh, at uh, at Towson was I met my wife, Lori, who was a Zeta, and we married just after my graduation and been married for 36 years. Uh, I've got two sons, uh, Christopher and Michael, who I'm very proud of and their respective professional careers as they've gone on to be fine young men and now have one grandson, Cassidy, who I hope to uh, continue to see him grow into a true gentleman as well. That's awesome. So tell us, you, you indicated you pledged as a sophomore. Uh, what did SAE mean to you when you joined? Well, I, when I first went to Towson, I was very actively involved in a lot of different things, um, trying, as most students do, trying to find what really clicks. Uh, I was also involved in the, uh, in the music program. So I was in the marching band 
had a lot of things going on, but uh, was really looking for other opportunities. And one of the guys in our dorm invited me to, uh, to a, a, a meeting at the fraternity house. And I guess I just clicked. I clicked with my big brother. I clicked with some of the other folks that were, uh, were there, including Pledge Brothers. And I, I guess what it meant to me was a strong outreach to the campus. When you first go to school, especially as a freshman, you're learning your way around. I found in my sophomore year, I knew my way around campus, but I was looking for a little bit more and ways to grow and uh, saw the fraternity as a great way to do that. That's awesome. So a lot of times when we get to be our age, slightly seasoned, I like to think of us as, but what is it that you wish you had known then, say 18 to 30 or 35 that you know now that you could share with someone that was that age? I often think the biggest thing was I didn't appreciate the amount of resources that are available to young men or people on the college campus that most folks don't take advantage of. A couple key areas. One is just on the college campus. If you go to the Career Placement Center, the, the opportunity to help you craft your career, craft your resume, really get your story together. Uh, I probably didn't take advantage of everything that the Career Placement Center had to offer. And uh, looking back on it now, I had a great career, but as I came out of school, um, you know, going to the Career Placement Center when you've got two months to graduation is probably not the best timing. You probably want to get there a little bit sooner in your college career. I think the second piece of it from a fraternity perspective, I didn't really appreciate the vast amount of resources that were offered there as well. If you look at what the Fraternity Service Center offers today versus when I was in school in the early 80s, um, you know, obviously the, the, the opportunities are even more vast now, but back then I probably didn't take advantage of a lot of the, the career planning and professional leadership opportunities that were around. And probably most importantly, I don't think I tapped into the alumni resources, not only in at Maryland Alpha or in the Baltimore area, but across the realm. And that's something that I've, I've really noticed um, in my role on the foundation, as well as meeting uh, alumni, fraternity alumni now, is so many of them want to give back and so many of them want to provide mentoring and assistance to folks so they get off to a great start. And I don't think I, I appreciated that, nor did I take advantage of it as much as I as I should have. So, uh, Les, I sat in on a session uh, probably two weeks ago where you spoke to the Fraternity Service Center, the FSC, uh, all of the staff, and you spoke uh, specifically about your personal brand and, and how you've sort of grown and developed that brand over time. Can you tell us a little bit more about that and why you think it's so important to you? Sure, absolutely. When you think about brands as I have, I've launched a lot of brands, I've resurrected brands, um, and I've taken brands and take, and expanded them around the world. And so they're a, a passion for that. Uh, when you think about individuals, you also have a brand. And, and if you think about a brand, a brand is nothing more than your connection with a company or, or a product or a service. But equally important, a brand really talks about how that company, that product is relevant to you. And, and I'll talk about DeWalt Power Tools as an example, where I spent a lot of my career. Uh, we, it wasn't always about the tool. It was about how does the product make you more efficient? How does it make the end user safer? How does, how does it make them more productive in their job? And sure, you can have great merchandising, you can have great marketing, you have great advertising, but really what the end user wants to know is how are you relevant how are you relevant to that end user's job? So if you think about that and turn it around another way, how are you as an individual relevant to your company's success? So I'll give you a, I'll give you a question, Steve. I mean, obviously you're a big time golfer, right? I'm gonna interview you for a second. Uh, I, I like to play. I didn't say I was good. <laughs> well, pick, a, pick a product, pick a product or a brand that's relevant to you. Any product. Uh, Tylus, Tylus golf balls. Titleist. And why is Titleist Golf, or why is that relevant to you? Because uh, it does what I need, um, mostly. I, I, you know, I've played, I've tried Pro V1, Pro V1X, but I've, I've actually sort of backed into the AVX, which I, it's going to sound silly, but it has less spin. And I don't have a lot of swing speed anymore. And so it has a lower compression and it gives me what I need. And it allows me to be a better player than I would be with 
another ball. So, which is important. So bottom line is that brand, that product is relevant to you because it improves your overall performance on the course. Yep. Yep. Now think about it from your perspective as a AT&T executive where you worked for many, many years, pick a role that you were successful in. So why were you relevant to AT&T's success? In- uh, I would say more often than not, because we found a way to make the number one but we found a way to make our people better and we helped them be more successful in the long term. Because I always looked at it for me as my role wasn't just about the number, but it was about developing people for the next generation that could make a number. And it's uh, making a number is not that tough. It's making your people better. That's hard. And if you can, if you can grow and develop people, then your job is, you know, it's mostly done. Sure. So, so in that situation, your relevance to the organization was consistency in making the number as well as developing the next generation of AT&T. Yep. So that was your relevance to the brand. So I look at, you know, an individual's personal brand comes from that relevance and that importance that they delivered to the organization. And that relevance can be from uh, a corporate job that can be from community service. It could be in your own family life. Uh, I had a recent example where I talked to a young man who was uh, uh, interviewing for a job right out of college, and we talked about it, and he was the captain of his soccer team. And I said, that's great. What was your record? And he said, our record was 0-12. And I said, okay. What, what role did you play in that? Obviously, he's a captain with an 0-12 and, and record, and he, really, and he really struggled. But the more we dug into it, what we found out was during that role as captain of an 0-12 and 12 team, he kept the morale of the team up. He encouraged them to practice harder and always work for the next game. Uh, and he never lost a teammate. Nobody ever quit from the team on carrying an 0-12 record. And I said, that's the relevance. That's what you want to talk about as a part of your personal brand. The, the fact that you were captain of the team, for, especially for an 0 and 12 team, did absolutely nothing. But what he learned as a leader is how he developed his own personal brand. And that personal brand is built up over years of experiences that you have. And a lot of times people think about jobs or the chairs that they sat in. And what I always encourage folks to do, I, I don't want to talk about the jobs or the chairs you sat in. I want to talk about the experiences that you had. It's because those experiences are what shape your personal brand, not the jobs. That's irrelevant to me. What I want to know is what experiences you have, what did you learn from that experience, and how have you utilized that to drive you to be a stronger individual? I, I, I couldn't agree more. I've had a lot of years where you're very successful. And sometimes it's almost in spite of you, right? If you get a good target, you get a good number, you've got momentum on your side, um, you've built relationships and things seem to fall your way. But I felt always the years where I learned the most and grew the most were the tough years where you had a couple of knocks and you had to fight through it and you had the option to either quit or make an excuse or to find a way to get it done. And, And those were always the years that I found help me grow the most uh, as a as a person and as a, a leader and it's it i always felt it gave you a little bit of empathy too for because if everything came easy you would get the bar would be too high but when you struggle then you understand that everybody can struggle and so i i was although i didn't appreciate it as i went through it i appreciated it after the fact so right. So sometimes being placed in the fire is not a bad thing. It, it, you learn to uh, you learn to be a stronger leader and, and uh, build your team around you and get things done. I'm going to throw you a curveball. We didn't talk about this in advance, but um, I always like to ask: um, Where was a situation where you went in and it um, failed? Is a strong word, but say it didn't. You didn't get the outcome you wanted, and what did you learn from it? And what did you do differently or better next time? Do you ever ever have a situation like that? Uh, I guess the, the question is, where did I make a mistake at some point in time in my career? And, and I, I, I tried to say it a little nicer, <laughs> but yes. <laughs> how, how did I redial? Um, early on in my career, it, it, and everyone takes their lead from the folks around, around them. You do it with your parents. You do it with your coaches. And a lot of times you do it with your first, second manager. You tend to find yourself acting like them or leading like them or coaching like them. And and, um, early in my career, I had uh, an executive that led through, let's call it intimidation. (laughs) 
Uh, the kind of boss that you want to bring in a first aid kit with you to the meeting because you know things just might not go well. And um, sitting in those meetings over the years and when, when things got critically bad, I used to watch uh, him shoot with both pistols. And uh, later in my career, I found myself in a situation where things weren't going very well. And I reminiscent of him uh, had a very, very difficult conversation in front of somebody in a, an operating review and really let them uh, let them have it with with both barrels. And I look back on it. And I, when I went back to my office, I sat down and I said to myself, man, that's not me. What just happened? And as I thought about it, I went back to that individual and I apologized and said, man, I don't know what happened. You know, the frustration bled out. I, uh, that's not the way I like to lead. And I strongly apologize. And I'll later apologize in front of my entire team to the individual as well. And so the mistake was taking somebody else's leadership style and trying to blend that into my own versus take what's important to me and the way I like to treat people and making sure I use that to make my own leadership style. Don't mirror somebody else, develop your own leadership style, make it your own and be successful that way. Um, because I, I learned a, a valuable, very valuable, valuable mistake um, that day and, and uh, never let it happen again, or at least try not to. No, I, I think that's, uh, I think you hit it on the head. I, at at t we were uh, VPs or fifth levels and uh, first level managers or sales managers, or second levels. And I would have that exact same conversation with every new manager that came into the organization is you have to find your own voice. You can't be me. You can't be somebody else. You have to be you. You have to be authentic because if you're not, people will see through that and you can't, you can't carry on like that. Um, so you have to be you. And I think if people hear that up front, because there are all kinds of leaders out there and they can all be good, but they have to be authentic. And so I, I think that's great feedback. I always like to ask people to think about the best coach the best boss, the best person you've ever been around and take those characteristics and mold them. And then also think about that manager that you wish you said, you know what, I am never going to be like that. And make sure you put those on the other side of the ledger and make sure that you, you build your career around that positive side. I, I, I truly believe a leader's job is to teach, to coach, and then to lead. And the only way you can do that is through a positive impact of all the people around you. And uh, they've got to know that, as you said, they've got to know that you're genuine in the way that you're working with them. So you've been on the foundation for a couple of years now, Les, and you're the vice chair. Um, what do you see as the future for the foundation and fraternity? Well, I'm still learning a lot about the foundation and, uh, and I continue to learn from yourself and from the other foundation trustees, as well as the honorary trustees and, and uh, the many other folks that I've met. Um, this is my first role working a lot with folks on the national level as well, including the Fraternity Service Center and the FNH. And um, I think that the fraternity has a lot of challenges not only challenges internally, but externally as well. I mean, the world's changing on the college campus. Uh, the way that we have to go and uh, recruit and what we have to compete against on the college campus to encourage folks joining the fraternity is difficult. Uh, and more importantly, the ability to engage and uh, keep alumni engaged in, uh, after uh, graduation has become more challenging as well. So I think the key thing is how do we, how do we continue the connection with undergraduates as they join all the way through uh, to alumni? Because alumni is, cru is crucial to the foundation's success. So I think that's a big part of it. I think the other big uh, opportunity is how do we continue to find new and creative ways to uh, fundraise? A big part of the foundation's role is to provide education and scholarship, and that's at the lifeblood of what we have to do. And you have to do that through increasing funds. And, and hopefully as the fraternity continues to grow, we should be able to continue to offer more scholarships and more education to, uh, educational tools to our undergraduate members. And the uh, foundation plays a big part of that. But uh, you know, fundraising is, uh, is a big part of what we have to do to make sure that we have the coffers to drive that. 
I, I think you hit it on the head. Uh, I've, I've heard it said before where you have to friend raise, then you fund raise, fund if you add, then you can fund to raise. And I think uh, we're starting to build the appropriate value proposition where people want to be more engaged again, which is a good thing because uh, you hit it on the head. We tend to lose people. Once they graduate, they, they start a family, they start their career, and they tend to drift off and they forget about some of the things that helped them get there, which is the fraternity for a lot of us. And then we have to get them re-engaged um, at, you know, at a national level and a local level even so that they start to give back and feel like they're a part of this organization again and then it's funny they start to show up again in their early 50s and 60s and they can remember their family's gone they're past you know a big part of their career where they can take a deep breath and say what's important to me now and we need to continue to find ways to keep them involved from the time they leave and that's that's one of the things that we've tried to do with the foundation in terms of the 20 under 40 just to keep the younger people in involved and some of these march the madness games are, are great because you see a lot of the younger because you don't have to put a lot of money in in order to have fun for the event and uh i, I don't know about you but it's it's my favorite time of the year one because you know growing up in indiana march has always been big for us well it used to used to be anyway <laughs> but um but well, it's such a well, it's, it's so fun to talk to people that you haven't talked to for years but I think that's why it's important, going back to our earlier conversation of, from, from my experience, how to make sure that undergraduates are tapping into these resources. Because the more that they utilize these resources, the more likely they are to give as an alumni because they want to give back and they want to continue that momentum. And it's extremely important that, I mean, people can give their time, their talent, and their treasure, right? And, and I think that uh, our goal is, the foundation, is to make sure that people see um, what is our purpose? Why is it important to continue to give back to our purpose? And if they've utilized some of the tools that we provide at undergraduate, I think they're more likely to continue to give as alumni when they can, as you to, to, as you point out, when you first get out of school, you have a lot of other priorities, um, you know, but we want to make sure that they keep the foundation and the fraternity and, uh, and top of mind and give when they can for the reason that they want to give to, you know, the, the purpose of growing and continuing the traditions within SAE. Absolutely. So we're, uh, we're about up against the wall. Les, is there anything else at all that you'd like to share with uh, the realm uh, in terms of uh, your thoughts? Again, about it. it could be anything. Sure. If it's not any good, we'll cut this out. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> Well, I mean, I, I, uh, I feel fortunate that I had a long career at, uh, within the hardware and home improvement industry, and I met a lot of great people and worked with a lot of great teams around the country. But one of the things I enjoyed the most in my career was people development. And one of the uh, opportunities I have now is to continue to mentor and give back to, uh, to folks coming off the college campus or professionals that are trying to rebrand themselves and trying to get back into the, the workforce. And um, I continue to uh, really preach a couple key things. One is as you're setting business objectives for yourself, uh, make sure you're looking for opportunities where you can drive change. Because it's, and whether it's in their business life or whether it's in your community service, uh, where can you make the business or where can you make that particular nonprofit better? And that's always a fundamental question I like to ask everyone. From a personal projected, personal objective uh, standpoint, I, uh, I challenge everybody that ever worked for me every year is pick one personal objective that they're going to work on to make them better uh, in their role, in their family life. It wouldn't matter to me. I'd ask them to set a personal objective. And that could be financial skills. That could be language skills, because I work with people around the world who English wasn't necessarily their, their first language, um, but always ask them to figure out how do you set out a new task and set a personal objective for that uh, and then hold yourself accountable. So that's one thing that, you know, everybody I mentor, I really push to try to drive that. Uh, second big thing is uh, as people go to build their career or even after their career, um, remember to always leave a legacy. I don't care where you go. If you can find a way to bring positive change, continue to innovate yourself uh, and build on that success, um, I think that's extremely important. And, and I look at the, the quality of young men that we have in fraternity. I look at the quality of alumni that we have. 
Um, there's folks out there that can help you attack both that business objective and that personal objective. And the only thing I would encourage brothers around the country to do is use those, res use those resources that are out there because they are great individuals and they're willing to give back uh, time after time. That's, uh, I really appreciate you sharing that, Les. Uh, this has been a great conversation. So thank you so much for taking the time to do this. I know you've got a busy calendar coming back and forth between Florida and Maryland. And, um, so I just, I feel so fortunate that we were able to spend this time together. And uh, I'm thankful for you and the contributions that you've made to the foundation and the very steady influence that you've had and uh, the many experiences as CEO that we get to benefit from both as foundation and, and for the fraternity in general. So Les, thank you so much for all you do. I, I really appreciate you. Thank you. It's been my pleasure. Thank you.